Good evening. This lecture, Be'ezrat Hashem, will be Le'ilui Mishmat Sofia Sonia Batsara, Le'ofrat Shani Chaya Batmeya, Le'atzlachat Simcha Batjura Yaakovov, Le'ofrat Atinok Yitzchak Ben Yora, Le'ofrat Emma Bat Devora Yisakov, Le'ofrat Avrami Menachem Mendel Ben Zohar, and Rafuat Liora Bat Ala. Did I forget anyone? Also for Easy Bird, for Sara, Gloria, Batiael, and Shibut for Shmuel and Yael. nation in the whole world. The biggest enemies. Some would say the Nazis, some would say the Arabs, some would say, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of options. But the truth is, unfortunately, the sad truth, the biggest enemy of our modern days in the last 40, 50 years of the Jewish nation is the Israeli Supreme Court. There's never been an enemy that hurt Judaism more than these filthy, wicked judges, lefty traders that sits in the Israeli Supreme Court. Every one of the ruling was pro Hamas terrorists, always anti religious Jews. <laughs> always anti righties always lefty, always against Israel as a state. But from political decision, you know, it, it can survive somehow. We are used to it. The lefties took over the world. You can see in America what's happening. We're used to it. I'm not here to talk about uh, political decisions, even though they had one this week also. An Arab terrorist woman that called for the destruction of Israel. She's, she was disqualified from running into the Israeli Knesset because she's a racist and an enemy. And of course, they approved her. They canceled that ruling. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Problems like this have thousands. We, are, we got used to it, unfortunately. Today, they ruled that all conversions in the world are legal. Anyone wants to convert people and tell them you're Jew, legal, conservative, reform, gays, anti-Semite people, that's it. According to them, they don't care anymore who's a Jew, who's not a Jew, they don't care about the laws of conversion of the Torah, they look at this as a national thing. They don't care about religion. What's, why it's such a sad day? Now, every reform trader, wicked, Mechalel Shabbat, that married men to men, and eat pork on Yom Kippur, and have no connection to Judaism, and is an enemy, an anti-Semite enemy of the Jewish nation in Israel, like Bernie Sanders, and thousands of other lefty trader Jews that hate Israel and hate religion and they are pro-abomination and they are enemies of God number one on earth. There's no more wicked people <coughs> than them in the entire world. Every one of them will be qualified to convert any guy he wants. 
Nazis, Germans, Chinese, Japanese, Arabs. Come, Mr. Lee, you're Jewish, here. I'm a reform rabbi, take it. But you married to a man, you eat on Yom Kippur. You're a big Russia, you don't believe in the Torah. It's okay, the Israeli stupid Supreme Court gave me permission to make you a Jew. Go to Israel and get qualified. And the government will pay you money for making Aliyah. That's really the law today. Do you know what it means? Now all the enemies of Israel, they don't need any more permission, permission from the Israeli government to make Aliyah. Right now Jews cannot make Aliyah. Real Jews or real converts. They can, can make Aliyah already for a year and two months. They don't let anyone in. Now you don't have to prove you're a Jew. All you need is a little paper from some reform trader wicked with his stamp. Anyone, even fake one. You can, you can pretend to be a reform. You can say, I'm a reform rabbi. What's your name? Ahmed Musa. I'm a reform, reform rabbi. Just open some kind of a, an organization. Call it the Reform Council of New York. Anyone. You give anyone a piece of paper, Hi, I'm a Jew, you must let me into Israel according to the rules of Israel. That means all the enemies of Israel need now, they don't need to fight us anymore. I don't know what, why Iran should waste time on a nuclear bomb. All they have to do is just come, pay a few thousand dollars, get thousands of those letters, or they make them themselves for free. They come to Israel, Hi, what's your name? Musa. What's your name? Ahmed. What's your name? Chris. I'm a Jew, look, yalla, you have to let me in. According to this country, uh, can, uh, the law of Israel, constitution of Israel, according to them, they must let them in. Do you understand why it's the saddest day? That means today, officially, the destruction of Israel as a Jewish state has begun officially. Why I say the word officially? Because this process has been going on for decades. It's not, nothing new. Today you just got an official step. But what the Israeli government did, 30 years ago they brought 1 million people from Russia and Ukraine and other countries in the area. 960,000 of them were not Jewish. Only 4% were Jewish according to the Torah. As the Israeli government agency published a year ago, Alishka HaMerkazit Lestatistika, the official Israeli office of the Israeli government published the statistic. We brought one million Russians, 40,000 are Jewish, 960,000 are not Jewish, some of them are huge anti-Semite Nazis with SWAT sticker. Thousands living in Israel now. Having website of Nazis and Hitler and I Hitler inside Israel. Israel is full of Christian cemeteries that they form. They, they are, why they need to come to Israel? They hate communism. Putin will, would not let them do whatever they want. In Israel they can do whatever they want with the stupid democracy laws that they have over there. Plus, they got $15,000 each one of them, which in Russia they would have to work 10 years like slaves to save. $15,000. The Israeli government gave them money to, cut, to make Aliyah. So the Israeli government made, brought Nazis into Israel. Or just regular anti-Semites, Ukraine and uh, all kinds of other Russians. And some Russians that are not anti-Semites, but they are not Jewish. Why it's critical? Because now they already have children that flood Israel. A lot of good-looking guys and girls, blonde, blue eyes, which are desirable by the foolish Israeli men. They don't check. They meet a girl, she's Israeli, she has Israeli accent. They don't check that she's not Jewish, that the older children will not be Jewish. Because religion and them has no connection. Therefore, now it's already a zoo. Spiritual zoo already. Remember a year or two ago I told you, I don't know if you remember or not, that now there is no more orthodox, secular, and goyim. Secular is eliminated. That's it. There's no more chilonim. Now you have 
Orthodox Jews and go in. That's it. There's no more. This word Chilonim are, is obsolete. There's no such word anymore. Yes, we will continue because we're used to it, to say secular, but there's no more secular Israelis. All of them, as of today, are Bechezkat Goim. Every Israeli you meet now in Israel that is younger than 25 years old is most probably, possibly, a non-Jew. That's the reality now. And it's only going to get a lot worse now with this, with this ruling today. Therefore, in 10, 20, 30 years from now, when you would like to marry your children, you won't be able to marry them to anybody from Israel. Because the people over there will be certainty. Bechezkat goyim. What's wrong with goyim? Nothing is wrong with goyim. Some of them are much better than some Jews that I know. Some of them are pro-Israel. Some of them love God more than the, the Israeli secular people. That's not, we're not talking about who is good and who is bad. We're talking about what the Torah allows Jewish people to do and what they are not allowed to do. The creator of the world separated Israel from all the nations and forbid them to marry any Gentile. Righteous Gentiles and needless to say wicked Gentiles. It's nothing to do with racism. I must keep you as a group. If I will allow you to mix with anybody else in the world, in two, three generations, there's, never gonna, there's not going to be any more the Jewish nation, the, the, the nation of God, the children of God, the chosen people. It will be eliminated. Why? Because the nature of people to marry who they like. And since you are all in, I scattered you all over the nation because of your sins, and you live in China, and in Hong Kong, and in England, and all over Europe, and in America, and some Arab countries, and in India. And obviously you're going to meet a lot of pretty boys and girls, and you're going to like them, and you will marry them. After two, three generations, there's never, nobody will know who is a Jew, who is not. That's it. It's going to be all mixed. And the Jewish nation will be eliminated from the world. And the whole purpose of the creation will be destroyed. Because the whole purpose of the creation was that I will give my Torah to somebody. Who will be that somebody? You have to earn it. You don't just get it because you have beautiful eyes. No. Why the Torah was not given to Adam? Adam in the sin. He lost his man. Why the Torah was not given to Cain? He murdered. He lost his merit. Why the Torah was not given to Abel, it wasn't a tzaddik. We started to go, generation after generation, everyone is wicked. Why? Finally we got to Noah. Let's give the Torah to Noah. No, Noah has three sons, two of them are wicked. One is righteous, not good enough. I don't want the Torah to be given to two wicked sons. So let's give the Torah to Shem. Let's check what came out of Shem. Oh. A lot of people came out of Shem, not all of them were righteous. Okay, so we have Avraham Avinu. He came from Shem, he is very righteous. Yes, he is righteous, but he has a son, Ishmael, Pere Adam. Yado Bakol Veat Kol Bo, came from Hagar. I don't want him to get the Torah. Okay, so let's give the Torah to the son Yitzhak. He was the good one. Yitzhak has a Sav. I don't want a Sav to get the Torah. A Sav, in case you didn't know, is the Nazis. And Ishmael is the Arabs. Okay? Nazis is not only German. Because Nazis came from Amalek, who came from Esav. The Gemara in Masechet Megillah, page 6, the Gemara described who came out of Haman. Haman Ha'agagi. Haman Ha'agagi, which we just read about him in Purim, in the Megillah. Why his name is Haman Ha'agagi? Agagi means Agag the king of Amalek. So Amman is Amalek. Amalek is a despicable nation that God hates the most in the world, from all the nations. They are the only nation that is a mitzvah to destroy them. There's no other nation, no Gentiles in the world that God say go and kill them. No, there's no such thing. The opposite. Some of the nations, God said, respect them, don't fight them, they are your cousin, they are your brother, they gave you food on your way out, you had a place in Egypt to sleep. The Torah found good things to say about some of the goyim. 
Even in the Talmud, some of the nations, the Gemara, they complement them. You can learn from the Persian modesty, you can learn from the Indies, you can learn from that. okay. Amalek, now one positive thing about them, which I'll explain soon why. Why God hates them so much. They earned it. Not because of the, the way they look. They actually earned it. Anyway, so now uh, Esav, from Esav came Amalek, and from Amalek came Haman, and from Haman, the Gemara say, Haman Agagi, Germany came out of Haman. Germany, so Germany, the Gemara say, almost 2,000 years ago, before there was a country named Germany. This is Germany of Edom. Edom is a sub. Why his name is Edom? Because he ate from the red lentil soup that Yaakov made. Adom, Adom, Edom. Same letters. Okay, so who came from the sub? The Nazis, Germany. But it's not only Germany. It's Romy, which is the Italians, it's the French, it's some of the Russians. A lot of the Europeans are children of Esav. You understand? We say Nazis because of our whole horrible history with the Nazis and the Holocaust. But even if there was no Holocaust, it would be the children of Esav, the children of Amalek. We know without Holocaust. We focus mainly on the Germans because they are the ones who are in charge of the Holocaust. But there are many nations who cooperated with them. Italy was with the, with the Nazis, you know, even Japanese, even though Japanese are not the children of Islam. There's other countries who are guilty here, some more, some less, the Polish. One way or the other, Hashem did not want to give Yitzhak the Torah because he had Esau, and Esau brought a lot of evil to the world. I don't want to give them Torah. So now who left? So from Yitzhak, you have Yaakov. Okay, let's check Yaakov. Yaakov, all his 12 uh, tribes that came out of him, they're all righteous. Oh, now we're talking. Let's prepare them for the acceptance of the Torah. I send them to slavery, they'll be there. How many years? 86 years they worked like slaves from the 210 years they were in Egypt, which is about three to four generations. Enough time to change the mentality of free, wealthy, powerful, royal family into nothing, dust. You have no rights, no dignity, no power. You are a slave. They can kill your children anytime they want. You have no, no say. Nobody cares about you. They'll starve you. They take away everything you have. And you will be like this for 86 years. Why? Because I want to bring your ego down to zero, completely. The only way to bring the zero of a person down is to do to them what the Egyptians did to us in Egypt. Take you out of your homes, take away your property, put you in camps, make you slaves, beat you up like animals. After three, four generations, you have no say. You don't make a beep anymore. Excuse me, can I say something? I disagree. There's no such thing. You're slave, you're nothing. Nobody cares about what you say. Why Hashem brought us to such a level? Now, you're willing to accept the Torah and to follow all my instructions. Why? Because you're mentally ready for it. If I will take you from a rich, spoiled, royal family and tell you you must do this, you have to wake up early in the morning, you have to work very hard to prepare tefillin, a year of process, to write Sefer Torah will take you a year, you have to, you know, all these things you have to do to bake matzot and to get dirty and to clean the house for Pesach two or three weeks before. Who would agree such thing? Take some uh, Arab royal uh, spoiled prince from Dubai. Tell him, excuse me, Said, come, let's see how you're going to be a Jew for one month. Have to learn, break your head, go clean the oven, break it apart, clean the bathroom, clean the house for Pesach, check between the books, maybe there's the breadcrumbs. <laughs> He'll kill himself after 24 hours. From the spoiled life he had into becoming a servant, it would be very difficult mentally. So this was the whole preparation for the day that God gave his book to the chosen people. Now what? Imagine the chosen people say, okay, we got the Torah. Let's marry anyone we want. If the Torah did not have this restriction on intermarriage. Two 
three generations later, Jews mixed with all the other nations, Jew married to Arab, to French, to Chinese, to Japanese, to Korean. Everybody got mixed. Nobody knows anymore who is who. So what is, what is, what's going to be with the Torah now? They're going on Allah to the Torah unless they convert first. And so who, where, is, where is the original Jews? Gone from the world. That's why it's a serious restriction with extremely huge punishment. Extremely huge punishment. Today, unfortunately, we live in such a horrible, low spiritual generation, such a low level generation that people do not know anymore what's strict and severe and what you can be lenient with. What you have to be extreme and what you can be lenient. Everything is a salad, everything got mixed, nobody knows anything. I'll give you an example. Today, more than 70% of the Americans are married to non-Jews here in America. Silent Holocaust. Almost every American who married a non-Jew, none of his relatives cut connection with him. They all stay the same. Friends, family, everyone the same. Married to non-Jew, so what? What's the halacha? They ask this question to the biggest rabbi in the history of America. Huge, giant, holy Talmud Chacham, Rabbi Victor Miller. My, my uh, cousin, Mary an Anjou. Again, nothing to do with an Anjou. It can be uh, Itro, the holy Itro, the prophet of the Goim. It can be a holy Goy. Itro is in the Torah. It can be uh, uh, Iov. Iov is a better example because Itro converted. Iov stayed the Goy. Iov, there's in the Tanakh, the book of Iov. He never became a Jew. So it can be Eov. Miriam, Miriam, the Jewish Miriam from Queens, married Eov, if it was possible. Miriam is a huge criminal. Why? But Eov is better than 90% of the Jews, even Tamilei Shiva, holy men. God gave him, the, we learn a lot in Judaism from the book of Eov. No discrimination. Doesn't matter, you don't understand. It's nothing political here. It's not because you are better than a Goim, no. They go in, kvodam bim koma munach. They deserve what they deserve. Here, it's a strict rule to keep you as one nation. You break that fence, you're a criminal. A big one, huge one. They ask her, Victor Miller, what should I do from the minute my cousin, my nephew, my brother, my son, they marry an Anjou. The answer. You saw it? He actually said about the mother, what happens if your mother? Somebody asked my mother just married because you have no mother anymore. Yes, a mother, needless to say, a mother. His own mother, in a second marriage, married to an Anjou. He says like this, anyone from your relatives, include your own parents, marry the Anjou, they don't exist for you anymore in your life. And I'm allowed to speak to them another word ever again. Ever. Not hello, not how are you, not come over, not can I help you, nothing. They don't exist. Today, not only that nobody cares about this law, business as usual, you go and eat with them in a restaurant, you invite them to your own home, they sit in your house on Shabbat. Or in Lela Seder, with this Goya, no problem. Not only that, not only that, you don't even think that something here is uh, so bad. Why? She's a nice woman. Again, you mix the law with feeling. Nobody ever says she's not a nice woman. Nobody ever says we have to hate her. Nobody even says that it's because of her or him or anyone else. It's nothing to do with them. They are not the side here. Leave them alone. It's not their fault. It's your fault. You went against your own father that gave you the Torah and restrict the intermarriage severely. Now every time she is with that guy, she gets a huge punishment for that individual time, multiplied by thousands of times. There is no end to her head, no end. It's never gonna end because of the punishment that she's going to get for it. And him, same thing, by a man, no difference. 
But a man, it's even more critical because his children also will not be Jewish. That's it. It's the end of their genealogy. The family is cut. By a woman, at least the children will be Jewish. She's still going to get a huge punishment for every time she was with him. But at least the children will remain Jewish. But either way, it's a very big crime. From Avigno Miller, answer, you know, he was never mixing feelings, politics. Answer the truth as it is. That's why I admire him the most from all the rabbis ever in the world. He is, for me, the most perfect one I've ever seen. Why? He never, ever, ever moved an inch from the truth. Not because what people would say, what they would say about me, who will accept it, who will get angry. People may not like the religion after they hear the answer. He never cared about this thing. Why? For very simple reason. When God gave the Torah, did he know all the future? Yes. Did he know he's going to be so many losers in this generation, so many liberal Jews, so many anti-religious Jews, so many Jews who grew up in public school have no idea about Judaism, so many weak people that follow their, their heart and not their head, so many people that are mentally sick, so many people that are Erev Rav, that they hate the religion so much, so much intermarriage in the world, so much materialism that destroyed a lot of the Jews in the world, in all of that. He knew there will be a majority of the Jewish kids in the world learning in non-religious yeshivot, non-religious school. He knew many Americans will be married to non-Jews. He knew there will be so many reform and conservative and all kinds of idol worshiper Jews and cults among Judaism. And he, he knew everything. And yet, he told us what's right and what's wrong in the Torah regardless. We're not, we're not, able, we're not allowed to negotiate to negotiate with any rule of the Torah because we are in a different generation. Some people say, why are you not so strict about it? It's written horrible things about it. Yeah, we are a weak generation. <laughs> so what? Hashem did not know there's going to be weak generations in the future. Why did he still write everything? It must be this Torah will never change. That's one of the 13 principles of Judaism. This Torah will never ever change, ever, even when Mashiach come. Even when Mashiach come, the Torah will never change. Not in the most amazing times, and not in the most this terrible times. It will never ever change. The Torah, that's the truth. You either comply with the truth and match your lifestyle to my book, or not. If you will, I will reward you endlessly. If not, I will punish you endlessly. That's it. It's not open for negotiation. So you better wake up, you start from a lower, lower point, and you will get there. It may be harder for you. I will take to consideration the difficulty, yes, to give you even more reward. Or maybe to have a little bit more mercy when I punish you when you fail, yes. But the truth is not open for negotiation. That's how we have so many reforms and conservative and so many enemies of Torah and Judaism among the Jewish nation because of what I just said. Every one of them thought, I am another God. I own the Torah. I allow people to compromise. Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> who are you? Who do you think you are? I'm a rabbi. So who cares? So you're a rabbi, so what? Hashem is, is higher than you, no matter how great you are. There is no permission to compromise with the Torah. When the Torah told you that the punishment of Mechanel Shabbat is worse than the punishment of murderer, that's how it was in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, that was in the time of Rabbi Akiva, and that's how it is today. Nobody is allowed to come and say today, oh, no, today it's no big deal to be Mechanel Shabbat. Don't? Ah, no, 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 no. Same Torah say 3,000 years ago that some Jews that grew up 100% like Goim and they kidnapped them when they were babies and they have no way to know Judaism, that's a different law. Why? It's called Pinoch that was kidnapped. Baby that was kidnapped. So the same baby that was kidnapped then is the same baby that was kidnapped today. You understand? So that means in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, 
if a gang of goyim would come and see a Jewish baby among the camp and they grab him and run away to, I don't know, to Saudi Arabia or anywhere else, and he would grow up like a non-Jew because he doesn't remember he was born a Jew, this person is not guilty of not keeping Shabbat or eating kosher because he had no way to know. Okay, same thing today. Same thing today. Some Jewish people gave their babies to the, to the French church. Why? Because the Nazis were on the wrong way to kill them. They said at least they should leave. Some Jews say better they will die righteous and go to heaven than to grow up Christian, idol worshippers. Not only did they not give their babies, they made sure the Nazis will kill them when they see it. To make sure that the baby went to heaven. If I give it to the Christians, they're going to raise him as an idol worshipper, believing in JC and, 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 and breaking the second commandment of the Torah, Lo Yelcha Elohim Acherim, I rather he will die righteous than grow up wicked. But it's okay, and it's again, depend on the level of those Jews in the time of the Holocaust. Those kind of babies who grew up in places like these and became really priests and all kinds of nuns and all kinds of things, which from time to time we find out they are Jewish, you know? So what the, the, the main cardinal of France in the time of Sarkozy, when he died, he asked the second mission. He told that he's a Jew. He asked Rav Ovadia, Rav Sitrok was the chief rabbi of France. He asked Rav Ovadia himself, what should we do? It's a church here. Everyone is a Christian priest around his funeral. All the minister of France, now we have second issue for him, they say go to a separate room, gather ten Jews, and second issue for him. If I remember correctly, I think Sarkozy himself joined that room. If I'm not mistaken, he says also a Jew, his mother is a Jew, I don't know. By the way, today he was sentenced to one year in prison. The president of France. Corruption is everywhere. In Israel, the Prime Minister Olmert, very corrupted guy, went to jail for a few years for receiving millions and millions in bribe and doing all kinds of other things. The Minister of the President of Israel, Katsav, went to jail. What's the difference between Katsav and Olmert? Two people went to jail for a few years. One sat in jail and learned the whole Gemara and finished the Shas and came out by Tshuva and he's hiding himself from social life, sitting, learning to Torah, broken from the horrible experience he had in jail, but at least something good came out of it. He made tshuva, became ultra-Orthodox, before he was the Tiloni, very, very modern, or Orthodox, very modern. Now he runs away from the garbage, from politics, sits and learns Torah all day, enjoying his grandchildren, his children are more religious, his grandchildren are more religious. At least he has a share to the world to come, even though he committed some crimes. The other one came out of jail ten times worse than he went into jail. It's a big field. Anti-religion, anti-Hashem, anti-religious people, hate Netanyahu, jealous, all they spread about people, all kinds of things. Not only did not come out better, came worse. When I, when I spoke in jail, I was speaking here and he was right here, behind the wall. That was his room. When I spoke there in Keller Amle, I asked the rabbi, bring, bring him. Many people would wake him up, this field. So he said to me, no, he can't. There's only three people allowed to see him. Me, the commander of the jail, and somebody from the government. That's it. He's in an isolated place. Why? He knows all the secrets of the nuclear of Israel. One of the prisoners can blackmail him. Come with a knife to his team, give it to me or I slaughter him right now. Then he gets the information, sell it to the enemies. It's the end of us. They isolated him in a private room. He could not even come to lectures. Look how Hashem made it that he won't even have the merit to come and because in jail rabbis come and speak. They are interested. Jail in Israel is the only place that the secular people invite and endorse Orthodox rabbi. The more strict, the more they admire them. There's no place that they love me more than the Israeli jail over there. 
If I go to the place of the lefties, they are allergic. Ooh, fanatics, extreme, that. But in a jail, wow, where's the respect? Why? Every lecture I give there, what happened with them? There's one more month with no fight. They learn more Torah, they get inspired, so they don't have work. No breaking fights, no stabbing, none of these things. So they want people that speak strong, because they make the prisoner become more religious. And when you become more religious, you, you are less aggressive. You're more into Gemara, you learn Musar, you participate in the learning. It's a great job for them. They're happy. They endorse giving out CDs. They give out CDs on a big plasma screen. The prisoner sits between classes, they learn Gemara, at night, they watch videos. Go try to get into any public school in Israel, any Orthodox rabbi. They don't let. Never. You cannot enter the door. They won't let you speak anywhere. Why? <laughs> Over there, they don't want the student religious. In jail, it's good for me that they are religious. I can sit and play Sheshbesh and eat hummus. Why? Nobody bothers me. Rabbi, come, come. Why don't come? Why only once every three months? You should come more often. You have to see. When you come, what the respect they give you. Why? You save them headache. They don't have problems. They're so happy. 100%. Anyway, so conclusion of what we say. Like I said, intermarriage is not a matter of racism. There's no difference any kind of Gentile, white, black, Arabs, German, Chinese, Japanese, enemies of Israel, lovers of Israel, righteous Gentiles who keep the laws of God, wicked Gentiles, idol worshiper Gentiles, or different, everyone is forbidden. So you see, there's, there's, a, there's many different levels among the Gentiles. You can't put them all in one level. You know, some of them are big lovers of God and the Jewish nation, and they keep the seven laws. They're not idol worshippers. They're not following JC or any, or any of that. They're very positive, and they have a share to the world to come, and they go to heaven when they die, these Gentiles. And even those, we are not allowed to marry them. Even a Jew that is Mechalel Shabbat, Rasha, thief, a murderer, a rapist, and everything else you can think of, cannot marry a righteous Gentile. So you understand that it has nothing to do with racism. And it has nothing to do with who's better. Nothing to do with who's smarter. Nothing to do with who has more money or not. Nothing whatsoever. It's unconditional law. It's a decree. I need my nation to be reserved. That's why I do not allow them to mix with the nation. Once for all, people should understand that because a lot of the people argue emotionally. Why? Why can't I marry her? She's a wonderful girl. We're not arguing about this. If, some, if, some, if Rabbi argue and say, no, she's not good, she will betray you, look what happened in the Holocaust, they called the Nazis about their own husband, the Jew. Well, that's, not what I'm going to, that's not the argument I'm going to use. Because for every Goya like this gentleman that called the Nazi, my husband is hiding in an attic, there were probably many of them that risked their life to save their, their husbands. So that's not a good argument. There are good and bad people everywhere. Some Israelis who marry Goyot, they were, they were very nice people. And some of them were horrible people. Some of the Jews are very good people, and some of them are horrible people. It's, it's, you cannot come and put a stamp on a whole nation. They're all bad. They're all garbage. They're all good. It's not working. It's not. Every human being has good and bad in him. He was born with, uh, with natural traits that came to this life from past life when he was reincarnated. And from the moment that he came to the world, now the, with the Torah and the influence of his education in yeshiva, he will be able to improve his traits or to, go, to do the other way around, to become worse. Some people came to the world a little violent, and after 20, 30 years in this world, they became mass murderers. They're much more than just violent. Some people were not such modest people, and 20 years later, they became mamash pedophiles. <laughs> Terrible. Some people came to the world, Mechalele Shabbat, grew up like Goim, and all of a sudden did Shuvah and became very righteous. 
Most important thing is I always tell you, if you do not fix your character traits, you basically achieve nothing. You're a robot that keeps the laws, but you did not achieve nothing. The, the country does not want people not to murder because they're afraid of the cameras or they're afraid that they're going to go to jail. The country wants people not to murder even when there's no camera. And even if no one catch them. Why? Because it's the wrong thing to do. You understand? I give you an example. When you come to a house of religious people, let's say you come to two religious families, one Shabbat after the other. Okay, so the first Shabbat, you come to us of this Hasidim, somewhere in New York. You find out that the children over there are like soldiers. The father comes to the Kiddush, they all stand. When they begin to sing, they all sing. When they need to, need to clear the table, they all fight quickly. Who's going to clear the table? They're all very, very, very well-mannered. Then you go the following week to another Hasidish family, the same thing. They're also very nice, they sing, they stand, it's manners, everyone dressed, everyone has their hat, everybody in his turn says nice divre Torah, same thing in both families. In one family, the children are all great and righteous. And the other family, none of them is righteous, they're all robots. But it looks exactly the same. In both families, you were so impressed that you said to yourself, please God, give me children like this. But you're wrong. In one family, you really want children like this. On the other family, the last thing you want is children like this. Who understood what I said? Not you, you're a Hasid. You come from inside, you have experience. I'm talking to people that don't know. Who can tell me the difference? By the way, it's nothing to do with Hasid. I'm just using it as an example. It can be the same thing with Sfaradim and Litvish and anyone else. Who can tell me what's the difference between those two families? Very simple. In one family, the father is a dictator, behave like a Nazi. Everyone is shaking for me. If you do something wrong, punishments, this, screaming, abusing. You're so afraid that when he's around, you stand like a soldier and you do everything not to get him angry. What will happen when he goes away for a week on a business trip? They all act like a monster, breaking, fighting, cursing, throwing, nobody cleans, nobody cares about the kid nothing. Why? The general is not here. That's one family. The other family, nothing to do with the general. He gives them so much love and, 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 and attention and teach them well and set a perfect example. And the mother is great. And they are so, and plus they go to good yeshivas, so they have good rabbis. So from all over, that's the way they learn and they understand that that's the right way to behave. Not because I'm afraid that he will throw me and lock me in a room or take away my bike, or, or punch me, I don't know. <laughs> Not because of that. Because it's the right, thing, way, right way to behave. So that means if the father is not there, they're still going to be like that. They don't need him to be there, to, be right, to, to behave right. That's a well-mannered, educated family. Children that are righteous. Why? Because they got the right education and the right example. To threat people, just like in the army. Why are you not falling asleep when you guard? You're afraid to go to jail for, for three weeks. They catch you sleeping. You understand? That's the way it was. Not because you think, I really care now to, to guard the base. But enemies won't come in. What's the chance that enemy will come in? One to a thousand? I'll take my risk. Let me fall asleep four hours. Four hours shift. But why are you not falling asleep? You're on alert. You drink 10 cups of coffee not to fall asleep. You walk with your gun around. Every nose is so nervous. Why? Why? Because you're afraid that they're going to come and ambush you. It happened to me. I had a friend, Temani, every night. It was middle of the night. Right? Middle of the night. 
So, we have a transistor. Back in my time, there was no smartphone, no internet. So what did you do? You listened to transistor radio. I remember what we were hearing. And he said to me, Mizrahi, it's too much of a risk. <laughs> we, we lay like this, with a, with a weapon, without a freight, to a air. I said to him, look how quiet it is. Who's going to come? Then after half an hour, this, uh, his name was Leo Sharabi. Sharabi. I saw something over there. Sharabi, enough with your nonsense now at 3 a.m. What did you see? I'm telling you, I saw someone there in the bushes. The guy got up. You're right! With the flashlight. You saw something in the bushes. Put them in a jeep. Right to the jail. Then you learn your lesson. Next time when you come, you guard well, no transistor. Why? Not because you're a good soldier. Because you're afraid to get caught. Drivers in the highway now drive slow. Why? Cameras everywhere. Look in Ocean Parkway. Every block a camera. Everybody drives slow. Ten years ago when there's no camera, Ocean Parkway, Ferraris are speeding. You know how many people got killed over there? In accident? From speeding? Who knows? You can count over the years. They put camera in every block, everybody drives 25. <laughs> 25. 2 a.m. I finished my Tuesday night lecture, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Heading towards the prospect. It's empty. I have to drive like a turtle. Why? I cannot. Not because I'm a good driver. <laughs> turtle. Every block. Camera, camera, speeding. Red light, speeding, red light, speeding. <laughs> you drive like a turtle. You understand the difference? The Torah does not want to make you a robot. The Torah wants to make you a decent human being. If you do it right, it changes your nature. You're not arrogant, you're not proud anymore, you become generous, you become bal chesed, you're loyal. The most important thing, you get rid of your ungratefulness. People, have in their nature this horrible poison that called ungratefulness. No appreciation whatsoever, not to the parents, not to their children, not to the teachers, not to anyone who helped them, anyone who supported them, anyone who did for them, no appreciation. Two days later, they don't remember that either. Remember me? No, who are you? Remind me? What? I saved your life. Ten years ago, remember over there, I came, I saved you. Oh, yeah. How did you forget such thing? Why? Because you're ungrateful. If you're not ungrateful, after 500 years, you will never forget someone who saved your life. How can you forget that? Right? It shows about your nature. I told you once, Rav Shach went in a pouring rain. Pouring, he was in his 90s. You know how difficult for 90-something years old men to go to a cemetery in a pouring rain? With his assistant, he said, wait for me here, with the umbrella, wind. He went for half an hour, read the him and prayed by a grave of someone. He said to him, who, who is this? Why are you coming here? Why you came here? I, I never saw you doing it. He said, this is a woman who gave me a shirt. I only had one, one white dress shirt. Every time I wanted to do laundry, I had to go to the lake wash it, and sit there for hours without a shirt in the cold until the shirt would dry. So I was learning, but, you know, I was freezing. One time she passed by, she saw me without a shirt, she asked me, young man, why, don't, why, are, you, why are you sitting here without a shirt, you okay? I said to her, I'm waiting for my shirt to dry because I have only one shirt, I have to do one in my laundry, it becomes dirty. She said, I have another shirt for you, wait here. She went and got me a shirt. It was over 60 years, over 60, 65 years ago. He comes every year to a grave to read the Elif for her soul. That's called a kosher Jew. That's mandatory, by the way. Oh, it's Rav Shach. How many Rav Shach do you have in the world, Rabbi? One to a million? I, I, I'm not that one. I still want to be righteous. I'm not going to be Rav Shach. How he became Rav Shach? When he was your age, maybe he was like you. When are you? 18, 19, 20, 16? Who told you you cannot be like him? Just begin to work on yourself.
So unfortunately, like I said, 15 years, 15 years the Israeli religious members sitting in a government did not use their power to make an official rule that only Orthodox conversion count. These Erev Rav traders in Israeli Supreme Court who hates the Torah so much and hate religion so much, and I want to destroy everything religious, took advantage and just made an official rule in the Supreme Court. From now on, everyone who comes and says, I'm Jewish, you must accept him. End of Israel, officially. Millions of goyim, anti-Semites, terrorists. Now all they have to do come with a little piece of paper. Take one, doesn't matter. I am a Jew. Accept me. You must let them in. It became an official law. You know Supreme Court, I don't have to tell you. You cannot do anything against it. There's nothing you can do. Here you go. It is what it is. I want to bring to your attention, I wrote it down not to forget. We are living now in times with the technology that life becoming more and more dangerous every day. It came to my attention today that now they have software, terrible, it's really terrible, that they can take your face, your picture, and can do anything they want with your picture. can make a video about you, it looks in the video that you're moving, that you're shooting someone, and you speak with your voice. Imagine now, you have Ruben. Take a picture of Ruben, static picture. Now this app is going to make Ruben's face moving, mouth, and with his voice. They now did a video of this movie star, Tom Cruise. You heard about him? Hundreds of millions of people watching it now. They're all shocked. An entire five minutes, how he comes and scream and bang on the table and run and with his face, with his voice. One out of a million will not know that it's not him, that it's a fake video. That's the end of that's the end of the world. You can frame people in court like this, you can do anything you want to people. You are, it's, it's, I don't know what's gonna happen. <coughs> Imagine this. Imagine all of a sudden one day you wake up and your video is all over the world. <coughs> Until you will try to prove to people that it wasn't you and I've never been there and this film is a... That will be the end of it. By the time you're going to prove, you already be finished and your entire family will be finished. You understand what's happening now at the time? That's why I told you many times, do not watch fake news. Don't believe anything people show you. They can show you the 5G, build the, the trees. They can tell you people lost their head. It's all fake videos. It's very easy to make fake videos today. Anything you want. Anything you want, they can make. One, two, three. Anything that like you can make you fly like you're Superman. I see, you see in the movie that Manhattan is all drowning in one minute. It looks so real. Wow, tsunami. All Manhattan is gone. The next day you go to Manhattan, it's here. I saw in my own eyes, it's all finished. Buildings fail. How they do it with the, with the software? Basically, everything can be done today. There's a lot of young teenagers that are brainless, but they're very good with computer. Brainless, I mean, when they're not, they're not clever in life. They will do horrible things to damage the world, but they have the skills. So they can build video games, they can build all kinds of apps, 16, 17 years old kids that are very well with tech and they do all kinds of horrible things and actually mamash put millions of people in paranoia and panic. People don't sleep at night. Why? Every minute something against the vaccine, against this, against that. Crazy. Every other person today lives in paranoia. Non-stop paranoia. And no matter how, how many times you have to explain to people it's all fake news, relax, it's not real, I can prove to you here, let me send you a video. Oh, wow, thank God, thank you for sending the video, but there's no time, what are you going to do? All day you're going to sit and try to save people from their stupidity? It's impossible. 
That's why I'm telling you now, for those of you who listen, do not believe whatever you see. It doesn't matter, a doctor speak, a scientist speak, this one spoke, nothing. Don't believe anything. You know, you know there's a famous movie, there's a famous lecture about Bill Gates that he gave 10 years ago, that they used, the, all these conspiracy lovers, they use it like Bill Gates had a plan to kill 8 billion people in the world. Remember? That's, by the way, how they started all this conspiracy against the vaccine. That's the main video. That they take apart from Bill Gates' uh, Bill Gates' lecture that he gave in TED Talk many years ago, and they say, see, that's the plan of Bill Gates. On top of this lie, which now they made in Israel a whole show to prove that they never say that, it's all fake news, a very interesting thing, they showed the entire thing, what he was talking about, it's the exact opposite. He's actually a very righteous Gentile, one of the best on earth, that did more to the world than all of us combined. What he did for the world and how much money he convinced all the billionaires to donate to sick people and to all kinds of poor people all over the world. And they took him and they turned him into a lot worse than Hitler, him and his wife, even though they have a foundation that all they do is give tzedakah. And they gave 17 billion dollars already to Tzedakah. He sponsored a lot of abortions. So. Uh, again, I'm not saying, I don't know everything he does. I, I'm just telling you now that whatever they say that he said, it's always a lie. And they prove it to you. If any one of you understand Hebrew, I'll show you how. And now, based on that, they say that Bill Gates went to school with the, the, with the what's his name? Oh. Huh? Fauci, and they have a plan together to kill all of us, and uh, Rockefeller, he was a friend of Bill Gates' father, everybody add more to the story, and Obama is not really a man, Obama is a woman, and Obama's wife is a, is a man that became, it was Michael that became Michelle, and I have to see the nonsense that people send me, I cannot believe how dumb people can be. You know what's the good thing? This whole vaccine's conspiracy taught me that there's a lot of quality, a lot of quantity, but not too much quantity, quality. And I never cared about quantity. I told you many times. I speak about things that are considered controversial, knowing that after I finish my lecture, I'm going to lose hundreds of uh, listeners. And it happens almost every lecture, you lose people. How do I know I see on the app? 50 people deleted the app. Instead of going higher, sometimes it's go down. That means that right now, yesterday you had like X amount, in the morning you have 50 less. How do you have less? People get angry that you speak against, uh, against certain things and you are pro-vaccine, they get angry. Or that you make fun about the stupidity and the things that they watch on YouTube and they get offended because they're full of ego. So they can't take, the, can't take the pain. So the next thing, they don't want to listen anymore to the Torah. Why? Why is it? Because they only think they are Baalei Tshuva, but they never became Baalei Tshuva. You should know that. Just to claim you are Baal Tshuva doesn't make you Baal Tshuva. Baal Tshuva means you cancel your ego completely. When the biggest rabbis in the world say to do something, oh, I don't know how. Why are you asking me? I don't understand. Who cares what's my opinion? The, the biggest rabbi in the world say something, why, why are you still asking me? That's the way they should have react. It doesn't really matter my opinion, but you're a doctor. It doesn't matter. A doctor, scientist, I'm nothing. The Torah is, and the world is in the hand of the Chachamim. If the Chachamim tell you about left that is right, the Torah says you must listen to them. End of argument. That's it. One woman here from the community, right here, not far from here, she told me I was very much anti-vaccine, very much, until you started to talk about it. Every time you spoke about it, I was fighting with myself. And she was pregnant. And they did not know that much about pregnant women, if they're allowed to do or not. We spoke about general. She said to me, I said to myself, you know what? If the Chachamim say that you must take it, I put my trust in Hashem and I go and I do it. With 
twins in her stomach. Wow. She did it, Baruch Hashem, her life got saved, and the twins are alive, Baruch Hashem, everything is fine. Four kids in Israel now are in critical condition. The mutation kill young people and children just as much now. No more, ah, yeah, children don't have to worry, oh, I'm only 25, today, 36 years old died, that's it. No sicknesses, no, bad, no, no sicknesses history, nothing. Got it and died. Today they sent a video from the Israeli hospital, the head of the department spoke, begged with tears to people, I'm begging you. Everyone that died in the last month is people that did not get the vaccine. Anyone who got the vaccine doesn't even get here. And the few that still got it, got it very minor. Only those who did not get it are dying here. Don't count on us to save you. We will not be able to save all of you. The long collapse. Young people in their 20s. They get it in 48 hours, the lung is finished, and they choke, <clears throat> they can breathe with oxygen, they can breathe. They say, it's nothing more horrible to see people are begging to breathe, young people, and they can breathe. Children, I'm begging you enough with the stupidity and the resistance. Everybody must run and get a vaccine. But people are continuing, continuing with the shtuyot, chaval, it hurts me. One of my best friends uh, called me today, said to me, why do you need to speak about this? Forget about it. Who those who want, let them do it, those who don't, enough. Why? I don't think it's a good idea. I said to him, if you would see how many people I see every day that are sick and dying, <laughs> you would not talk. What's more important now, to teach people about Parashat HaShavua, that they're not the secret of what the parasha speaks about? Or after the lecture, maybe another 500 people will get a vaccine and another 50 of them will get saved from death. What's more critical right now? The boat is drowning. Okay, come give us a Gemara class. The boat is drowning. People are dying soon, they're going to they're gonna choke to death. No, no, but we have to, we, we, we want to, let's see what the Torah said. What's the point? We are in a time of Holocaust here. To the world, yes. They say that about three, four million people already died. The guy, the, the guy say that without the vaccines in Israel, right now it's six, six thousand six hundred people died. With, before the vaccine, about a hundred people would die every day. Now it's about around twenty. Eighty percent of the numbers went down. He said, without a vaccine, we'll be now by now 12,000 dead already. And the mutation, that's the problem, the mutation is deadlier. And it gets only worse. Every time there's a mutation, it's worse than the one before. That means if the people would refuse to get vaccinated, they will develop such a mutation that in the end the vaccine will not be able to end it. Yeah. We will be back in square one, unfortunately. Didn't you say it's better to wait? That was, that was only in the first two weeks when it came out. Before the biggest rabbis in the world say you must get it. I say right here, let's wait a month or two, get few, you know, millions of people to get a vaccine, and let's see. We see hundreds of them are dying every day, we don't want to do it, right? That's common sense. Let's see. Learn from other people's experience. But after the biggest Haredi doctors in Israel, Rabbi Nemelech Führer, went and investigated the whole thing from A to Z. And he came to the biggest rabbi and explained to them everything. And they ruled that you must get it. Immediately I came here, the following lecture. And I said, forget what I said. Now everybody must get it. That's halacha, the maaseh. Everybody must get it. And Bezrat Hashem, let's move on now. We had Purim now. Purim is finished. Now we are in preparation for Pesach. The Gemara says, There is higher probability that in Nisan it's going to be the salvation. Meaning, Pesach. Pesach, we had the salvation. Pesach, Pesach Hashem, we can have another salvation. I explain that the Gemara said that when Mashiach come, the holidays will lose their significance compared to now. Besides Purim. 
Purim will remain in effect in full power. It's a little bit strange because Purim it's a rabbinical holiday. It was made by the Chachamim. Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuot, this is all Torah holidays. How laws that were made by God will, have, will be not as powerful after the Mashiach would come, and laws that were made by rabbis will always remain in full power. Now that we have to understand that and would lead, that and lead me to the subject of tonight. When Mashiach come, there will be few things happening. Before he comes, there's going to be a massive war. It's called Gog and Magog. I have maybe 20 lectures just about that, and even a film about Gog and Magog. In Zachary 14, it's written that two-thirds of the people in the world will die in minutes. Then the only thing that say 12 minutes. So we already understand that we're talking here about the nuclear weapon here. Two-thirds of the world, we're talking 5 billion people in 12 minutes. Not three and a half millions after a year of Corona. So far, three and a half million people. Pandemic shut the whole world. Trillions of dollars were lost. United States deficit reached now officially 30 trillion dollars. And almost every American is born is born with almost 200,000 dollars debt to the government. Just when you breathe. Welcome to America, $200,000 deficit almost. Two, three hundred, two, 30 trillion. 30 trillion is 30 billion multiplied by a thousand. Three more zeros. Take 30 trillion divided by 300 million Americans. Do the math, see how much we owe. Take off the children, take the old people that cannot pay anything in the 90s, take away the little children. Each one of us already owe, owe the government with 150 to 200,000 dollars. That's besides your 70,000 you owe student loans, and besides the mortgage, and besides other things that you owe. So you already now a million dollar debt in average, and you live like a beggar. Nothing special, it's tiny apartment in Queens, look like a train, very narrow, you know, attached. Small living room, two, three kids in a room. Now that you live in a mansion or something, already you know, a million dollar deficit. So it says that uh, two thirds of the people will die, and the other third, it will be a period of time, months, years, not clear exactly that Hashem will clean the other third. Two-thirds of that, the third that will remain, will have a grace period. If they will do full tshuva, they will, they will get saved. Jews and non-Jews. If they will not do full tshuva, they will also be erased. So, five billion for sure will go. From the two and a half billion, we don't know for sure how many will remain. Maybe 100 million people, maybe 50 million people, we don't know. Based on what I see right now, based on what I see, the Jewish nation has only 50 million people official. If we judge them, approximately 12 million of them are not Shomer Shabbat, so they have no chance. Chalele Shabbat, Chalele Shabbat is 100% like an idol worshiper, goy. So they have no shot for what to come. And Yichret Ha'anef Yishayit, it's written 12 times in the Torah. So you have 3 million. That our Shomer Shabbat, partially Shomer Shabbat, putting tefillin, giving tzedakah, listening to rabbis, three million, that's it, in the whole world. Brooklyn, LA, Chicago, Israel, Europe, England, all over, about three million. How many from the three million are righteous? Not all three million, not even half. Just because you have a nice beard and you Shomer Shabbat does make you righteous. We just saw, to, thanks to the vaccine, how many people have dirty mouth, dirty mind, arrogance, chutzpah, ungratefulness, and zero respect to the chief rabbis of the world. Zero respect to the Torah. These are wicked people. They're not righteous. So I don't know what's going to be their end, but it doesn't look good. Because the Gemara say, Apikores, it's someone that never said Talmidech Chachamim. And the Gemara in Sanhedrin say, that Apikores has no shirt to the world to come. 
So they are in very, very, very big jeopardy. There's one thing you're afraid, which is a natural reaction. You're afraid of a vaccine, you're afraid of a medicine, you're afraid. But there is a complete different thing is that when you speak non-stop against it and brainwash other people to, to do against what, they, what the Chachamim ordered. It's a very big difference. So we don't know from the three million how many of them are really righteous that will have a share to the world to come. I don't know. But it's not all of them, that's for sure. The good news is that there are many, many millions of goyim that they are Jewish, but they don't know it. So they're born in Italy, Germany, France, in all kinds of countries, in India, in China even. They don't know that they are Jewish. Why, maybe four, five, seven generations ago, before the Holocaust, their parents hid the fact that their, their, their grandparents hid the fact that they are Jewish because of, of the anti-Semitism, and they died and they never told them, and they think they are not Jewish, and their children think they are not Jewish, and it's already four, five, six generations already of Jews that keep born to the world thinking they are Sicilian, Italians, all kinds of things. You remember the story I once said, that one day I get a call from Florida, I, Kvod Arav, Shalom, yes, my name is Asaf Cohen. Israeli, in Hebrew. I'm from Florida. Shalom, Naim Meod Asaf, how can I help you? You just ruined my life, Rabbi. Arasta li tachayim. How exactly I ruined your life without knowing you? I'm married to a Sicilian Italian woman. Sicily. Goya. We had one boy. My wife found your debate with a Christian priest online. She told me, let's watch the debate. I thought it's entertaining. We sat and watched the debate. And what happened? After the debate, she told me, I'm sorry, Asaf. I cannot live with you anymore. Take the boy, raise him as a Jew, convert him, I just realize he's not Jewish, I'm not Jewish. I'm not gonna go against God. I'm not Jewish, but I don't wanna be wicked. You're not allowed to live with me. And now we just found out that even if I will convert, we will still not be able to be married because a Kohen cannot be married to a convert. So <laughs> Tom, you understand why you ruined my life? I love her so much, she loves me, we had a boy. And now my whole family is finished. This is a perfect example how the brain and the heart fight. The brain says what's the truth and the heart refuses to digest it. Feelings. What's in it for me? Comfortability. Many different reasons. Selfish reasons. Difficult to overcome. You know the truth, but you, you, um, you force yourself to ignore it because, I, wow, I'm going to be miserable if I follow the truth. So I said to him, why don't you come to Monsi to the Shiva two, three weeks. We'll help you to get stronger. We'll see what we can do. No, I can. I'm working for someone. I get fired. So that was the end of it. Months later, she started to investigate the, family, the genealogy of her family. She started to investigate. What did she find? that her grand-grandmother was actually a Jew. She collected all the evidence from Italy, submitted it to the big Jewish court of Jerusalem. They gave her a letter that she's 100% Jewish and was always Jewish, not a convert. They stayed together, had more children, and I have a picture of them, him and her, Ultra, ultra, ultra orthodox with Bliya in a lot of religious kids. It was a very happy end to that story. Maybe now, by now, it's a family of, I don't know, nine, ten people. They're all ultra orthodox. Fantastic end to that story. But that's just one example of how many going you have like this in the world thinking they are Sitsim. They never go and check their grandmother over grandmother. I have no idea. Lots 
lots of them from Russian descent, from Indian descent, from Ethiopian descent, all these things. So those goyim, when Mashiach comes, what's going to happen with them? Depend. Now pay, pay attention, we're going to learn something you may never heard before. Depend on what spiritual level they'll be in. No one will ask them why you did not keep Shabbat. Obviously, they have no way to know what Shabbat is. No one will ask them why you ate pork or why you ate dogs. No one will ask them that. Go in allowed to eat whatever they want. Nobody will ask them about why you did not put fill in. But all the laws that are required by common sense of a human being, they are guilty of it. If they steal, they are wicked. Even though they're not, they don't know they're Jewish. Goim are also, they know they're not allowed to steal. If they chose to be Christian and they, fo and they follow JC, then there is a God to the world and they, f they follow a different God, a fake God. Or if they became Hindus and they follow all the fake gods of the Hindus. Or if they Buddhist and they worship Buddha. Or if they are Greeks and they follow the Greek mythology. And many other idol worshippers, cults and religion, they are guilty of being wicked. Because this is religions that even Goim are not allowed to follow because of simple common sense. How can I follow a religion that admire a person and not the creator of the world? Why did you not come and investigate like many other Christians did and they left it? So for that they are guilty. If they are evil people, they have no mercy on others, they never help, they never contribute, they always take advantage of people, they instigate between people, they are wicked people. Even if they do not know they are Jewish. So it can be a very interesting situation that Mashiach would come to a family of Goim, which they are all Jewish, they don't know, four boys and girls, four brothers, went to public school thinking they are Goim, they don't know they are Jewish. Then Mashiach would come and say to him, nice to meet you, all of you are Jewish. You and her remaining, you and her are finished, will not survive. Why? Because just because there are four brothers and sisters doesn't mean the whole life is so wicked. One always searched for God, always wanted to be good, always admired, thank you God for what you're giving me, thank you, thank you, wanted to do bad things and help themselves, even though they're not, they didn't know they're Jewish. Just as like our Gentiles. And the other one bowed down to statues, sacrifice all kinds of things to all fake gods. What are you doing? Where is your head? You bow down to a cow? You know, man? What do I know? My father did it. Your father is foolish. Who said you have to be like him? Your father will jump from the window. You also jump? Where is your head? This kind of Jews who thought they are going will be judged by going. But even a guy that bowed down to a cow will not remain when Mashiach comes. So let's think. You have seven and a half billion going in the world. Two billion of them are Christian following JC. Two billion are done. You have uh, seven, eight hundred million Buddhists. They're all idol worshippers. God. Hindus. Hundreds of millions of Hindus. There are more than 500 different religions and cults of idol worshipping in India. More than 500. Right the way you have about three and a half billion that are all idol worshippers. Then you have the Arabs. About 1.8 billion Muslims. None of them are idol worshippers. However, if they are murdering Jews or, or other Americans or Europeans go in because of the ideology, so they are murderers. Murderers, it's against the law for Goim. A Goim is not allowed to kill people. So automatically anyone who support murder or poor murder is also will be done. But there are many Arabs who do not want to murder. Leave and let leave. I want to be a good person. I believe in one God. I, you know, whatever they taught them that you're Muslim and you have to follow Muhammad, what do they know from their life? 
They have no idea that it's not a real prophet. Some of them will remain. And a lot of Israelis from Tel Aviv that dance in a gay parade will all vanish. It's unbelievable. You can have Arabs in Gaza, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Jersey City, that when Mashiach comes, he will tell them, you have them, or you earn the right to remain in the world. And there's going to be a lot of liberal Jews, senators, diplomats, teachers, professors, who will all be vanished. Why? Infidels. Heretic. Spreading things against religion and against God. Teaching evolution. And many other Jews who destroy the world with their false ideology. You know, Spinoza, many others spreading fake philosophy. So, I want everybody to wake up to understand. So, from the two and a half billions that will remain, how did we get to such a number? We don't have so many Jews in the world. The answer, most of them will be non-Jews. When Mashiach comes, many of them will remain, millions of them. Just because you're not Jew, you still have a possibility to remain when Mashiach come. Then what? Okay, so Mashiach came. Hashem slaughtered the Yitzhara. After the cleaning process finished, there's no more wicked people in the world. Hashem take the Satan, poof, it's gone. You're dead. There is no use for you in the world anymore. No more even inclination. No more attraction to steal. No more attraction to kill. No more attraction for gossip. No more jealousy. No more pride. No more anger. No more laziness. No more sicknesses. No more fatigue. No more concentration problem. No more panic attacks. No more sadness and depression. No more cheating, lying, deceiving. No more desire for idol worshipping. No more desire to disrespect Chachamim. All these bad will be all clean from the world. There will be only people that want to be attracted 100% to Torah and Mitzvot. Why? No resistance. Until now, there was a lot of resistance. Why you didn't come to the lecture? There was a Bukharian party in a basement. <laughs> How can I miss the great shish kebab and lamb and guj gujje and oshpalo? Come on. And good whiskey. What's his neshama wants to come to hear strong lecture? What's his body want to eat great oshpalo with great chunks of meat and good lechaim, this moishmo, and be happy? Why not? That's the body and the soul. The same thing. When, when a drug addict lights the, the cigarette, the drugs, that's what the soul wants or that's what the body wants? The body wants the nirvana, the great feeling. You know, I'm dreaming, I'm hallucinating. Then the shaman doesn't need this garbage. So life is all a fight with the body and the soul. So what happened over here about time? There will not, there will be no more Satan. No more. Once there will be no more Satan, and there are no more anti-Semite going left in the world, no more slavery, no more empires who bothers the Jewish nation, the third temple will be built, it will be an ideal world, perfect world, a perfect salvation. From now on, you will never have wars anymore between nations of Goyim to Jews. There's not going to be anti-Semite. Nobody will cheat. Nobody will hurt each other. No one will insult each other. Everything will be perfect. Nobody will be sick. You won't need hospitals anymore. You won't need doctors. Everything in the world will be perfect, ideal. For how many years? A thousand years. What will be after? Then Hashem will finish the physical world, and there is the final destination, what we call Olam HaNetzach, Olam HaNeshamot, the world of the soul. And there's a long time until we get there. So Rabotai, 
once all the dirt will be clean from the world and all the wicked people will be gone and everyone who made Hashem angry on a daily basis will all be clean, Jews and non-Jews, there will be a perfect salvation. Now, Rosh Hashanah comes. We must celebrate Rosh Hashanah. We will have Bet HaMikdash, we have the sacrifice, Rosh Hashanah, we'll blow the shofar, everything is usual. We will praise Hashem, we'll make Him the King. Beautiful! Everyone will be an hour before the nets in a synagogue. Nobody will show up to, to Musaf. Why? Because it's not going to be fatigue anymore. No, no laziness. You open up your eyes in the morning, what time is it? Five. Wow, great. Fantastic. Quickly, I can't wait to be in a shul. It will be a perfect room. Bet HaMikdash, Yerushalayim, they'll all be there. Wow, amazing. The smells of the lamb and the shish kebab there in the mountain, the music of the Levim, the, the orchestra of the Levim. Wow, what music it's going to be. It's going to spread all over. It's going to be an, an amazing thing. Now, Rosh Hashanah, Judgment Day. Judgment for what? There's no one Mechalel Shabbat. Everyone midot is perfect. No one cheat, no one lies, no one steal, no one goes against Hashem. No one's waste time on nonsense. Nobody watch dirty movies anymore. No addictions are in place anymore. So Rosh Hashanah judgment for what? There's not one negative thing. So Rosh Hashanah would lose his significance as a judgment day. Okay, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, day of atonement and repentance. Repentance for what? I did not say one bad word. I did not steal. I did not look at something. There's nothing dirty to look at. Everything in the world is clean now. So what's going to be? Yom Kippur lost its significance. Yes, we'll still have the service in Bet HaMikdash and the Musaf and the, the Avodah of the Kohanim, but there will be a whole different Yom Kippur. Why? Because nobody has to cry in Eila, Ashamnu, I'm sorry, Hashem, Hashem, El Rachum a whole different world. Okay, next, Yom Sukkot, Zecher Ritziat Mitzrayim. Yes, we still admire it, Yat Mitzrayim. What do we say in uh, Agadah of Pesach? Remember me in four weeks. When you read it. Huh? There is an argument in Chachamim. It says, Amar Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. It's a part of the Agadah. Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah said, Are ani ke ben shivim shana. I'm like seven years old. And I never saw that people speak about the exodus of Egypt at night until a Chacham named Ben Zoma came and made Rasha from the Torah and from then on we started to speak about Yitziat Mitzrayim at night Shneemar Kol Yemei Chayecha Yemei Chayecha Yamin Kol Yemei Chayecha Alelot to include the night. Why the Torah say call Yemechayecha? You don't need call. It's an extra word. And there's no extra word in the Torah. In the Torah should say that you will remember the exodus of Egypt in the days of your life. If the Torah say in all the days of your life, it's also can to include the nights. Day and night. That's the way he learned the verse. The Chachamim said to him, no. It's true what you say, but there is a different purpose for this verse. Yemechayecha, days of your life, is when you're here in this world. Kol Yemechayecha is also to include the perfect days of your life, when you separate from the body in the next world, Olam Abba. Kol Yemechayecha, it's not only in this world, excuse me, it's in days of Mashiach, not Olam Abba, days of Mashiach, when the world will be perfect. You will still need to mention the Exodus of Egypt. Why the Chachamim has to teach me such thing? Because the Exodus of Egypt and the salvation of Pesach will look like a joke compared to the salvation of Mashiach. Because after Pesach, still the whole world wants to kill us. We still have the Babylonians, we still have the Persians, we still have the Greeks, we still have the Romans, now we have the Arabs and so many other anti-Semites, anti-Semitism, United Nations, Sleepy Joe, Nazis, 
so many things. Still, the, the, it's not perfect. We did not get rid of the, of the slavery that we have by all these anti-Semites. Plus, how many people came out of Egypt? 20%. 80% died in the, in the darkness, meaning 12 million died. So it wasn't a perfect salvation. So when Mashiach came, you may think, now, until now, I had a silver coin. That's all I had, so I loved it. Wow, I look at it, it's so beautiful. Now you took my silver coin, you gave me a big diamond. It's worth ten million dollars. This silver coin is fifty dollars. This this diamond worth ten million dollars. Once I have the diamond, I look at the silver coin or I forget it in a drop. I forget it in a drop. Comes the Chachamim and said, Don't dare to forget it in a drop. You still have to mention the Exodus of Egypt when Mashiach comes. Nothing is changed. Yes. Compared to the salvation you have now, you're right. There's nothing to compare. It's a final salvation. The third temple will not be destroyed. That's it. First and second was destroyed. Third one is permanent. Therefore, it's going to be such a perfect time. But we still need to say it when Mashiach comes. It's very interesting because there is a verse in the prophet Yeshaya. He talks about the snake. The snake, after he made Adam and Eve made a sin, Hashem gave the snakes three curses. Not one, not two, three. <laughs> What's the three curses that the snakes got? One, you will have hatred between you and mankind always. Second, you, you, I'll chop your legs off and you will crawl on your stomach. And third, everything you eat will taste like sand. Sand will be your food. That's it. No matter what you eat. You eat rat, taste like sand. You eat sand, taste like sand. Whatever you eat, you have no more flavor. When, when the Prophet Yeshaya speaks about the days of Mashiach, it's very interesting. He talks about how all the animals live in peace, and there's no, the tigers don't eat the lamb, and all the animals live in peace and harmony, it's going to be a great world. And he finishes his prophecy with a very strange sentence. Venachash afar lachmo. And a snake, even after Mashiach came, even after the whole world is cured, no one is blind, no one is handicapped, no one is poor anymore, there's no problem anymore in the world. All animals are perfect, they live in peace, they go in, the Jews, everyone in peace and harmony. But one thing will remain. What? The snake still eats sand. No more hatred between snake and people anymore. This curse is cancelled. The legs is going to continue to crawl. But eating sand, it's even after Mashiach comes. So when, it's, when you see in the Torah, the Torah, when the three curses came to the snake, only in the third curse, the Torah used the word kol yemechayecha. Ve'afar tochal kol yemechayecha. You will eat sand all the days of your life. What does it mean all the days of my life? From now on you will eat sand forever. That's it. What does it mean all the days of your life? All the days of your life. It means in this world and after Mashiach come. That's what the Chachamim learned. Why the Torah said to the snake kol yemechayecha? They went to, look how they connected the prophet Yeshaya, a verse in the Torah. They connected and they learned one from another. The prophet say, everything will be ideal except one thing. Venachash afar lachmo. Meaning after Mashiach came, the Nachash will still eat sand. The Chachamim asked, where the prophet learned it from? From the curses. Let's see. Curse number one, he doesn't say kol yemechayecha. Curse number two, it doesn't say kol yemechayecha. Curse number three, you will eat sand, it says kol yemechayecha. All the days of your life. Ah, the prophet translates kol yemechayecha also to the days after Mashiach would come. Why? That's why he said the snake 
is the only one that is scarcely still in effect. What? He eats it. So from here the Chachamim say, it's written in the Torah, you should speak about the Exodus of Egypt, Kol Yemechayecha. One opinion is, Kol Yemechayecha means day and night. Why not at night? Why not at night? Because this parasha is talking about tzitzit. Tzitzit is only in a day. You don't have an obligation in the middle of the night to put tzitzit, because today we have electric, but back in time there was no electric. Anyway, you cannot see the difference between light blue and, and white at night. So there's no significance for the tzitzit. You need it from, from dawn or sunrise when you begin to see the difference. That's when the mitzvah goes into effect. We don't take it even at night, because even when you don't have an obligation, you still get a reward, what you have to lose. But the real obligation is when it becomes light until it becomes dark. At night, it's not a time of tzitzit. And when we say Shema Yisrael, the third paragraph, Ayomer Hashem el Moshe, Daber Ubnei Yisrael v'amarta alem v'asu lahem tzitzit, al kanfe v'gdem ledorotam, how does it finish? Ani Hashem elokechem, אשר רוצתי אתכם ארץ מצרים להיות לכם לאלוקים, אני השם אלוקיכם, נכון? So, uh, the Tzitzi and the Exodus of Egypt is in the same paragraph in the Torah, and we say it in Shema Yisrael. But Tzitzi is not at night, but Yitziat Mitzrayim, you have to say at night. But nobody say that until Ben Zoma came and explained the Pasuk, meaning, in the old days they didn't have Tfilat Arvit, they didn't pray Arvit at all. There was a shoot. You want to pray, pray. You don't want to pray, don't pray. The Chachamim made it an obligation. How do we know we have to pray Arvit? Yaakov Avinu, Tiken Tfilat Arvit. How do we know we have to pray Shachrit? Avraham Avinu. How do we know we have to pray Mincha? Uh, Yitzchak Avinu. Vayetzel Yitzchak, Lasuach Basadeh. Avraham, second letter of Avraham is Bet. Yitzchak, second letter of Yitzchak is Tzadik. Yaakov, second letter of, of Yaakov is Ayn. What's the significance of Bet, Tzadik and Ayn? Avraham, second letter Bet, Boker, morning. Yitzchak, second letter Tzadik. What Tzadik? Tzorayim, afternoon. Yaakov, second letter Ayn. What's Ayn? Erev, evening. Inside their names you have the Ayn. Morning, afternoon, evening. But what prayers you have to say, they did not say Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Everybody pray with their own language. You can wake up in the morning, dear God, thank you for waking me up. I love you so much. I appreciate everything you do for me. What happened? I need to get married. I'm already, you know, starting to get gray hair. Well, what are you waiting for? Help me out here. Everyone in this language. Help me in the business. I'm stuck with diamonds, I have to sell my diamonds, I have to sell my pharmacy, everyone with his problems. But then, the Chachamim saw that people start to say all kinds of shtuyot, nonsense in their prayers. Hashem, I'm in love with Sarah, why don't you give me Sarah, I don't want Rivka, they offer me Rivka, I want Sarah, a lot of uh, ignorant. The Chachamim saw that some people made themselves more damage than, than salvation in the prayers. So they said, when the people are not exactly the way they should, let's set for them the right, proper prayers. First, when you start Filat Shmona Yisrael, praising God. That's the right order. First, praising God. Right? Hashem Sfatai Tiftach, Piyagiti Ilatecha. Let me say your, your glory. And right away, you give all the compliments to Hashem. Ofecholim, atirasurim, all these things that Hashem is doing. After that comes a list of 13 requests. Right? Atah chonen l'adav dat, baruch atah Hashem, chonen l'adav. Ofecholim, barech alenu, all these things that you need. Rain, parnasa, health, everything. It's all built into the prayer. Once you finish all the requests, comes the thank you. Modim anach mulach, we thank you God. And Baruch Ata Hashem, Atov Shimcha, Ulechan Ha'ele Odot. Your name is great, and you are the one that we should always thank. Right? 
אין ברוך אתה השם, המברך את עמו ישראל בשלום, פיניש. So, praising, requesting, thanking. In the old days, it would be the other way around. A person come, dear God, where is my million? I wasn't wired yet. Fair say Hashem, thank you for waking me up. Thank you for being so good. Thank you for curing people. Thank you for helping the world. When you come to meet the president, you don't walk in, hey, sleepy Joe, what happened with the budget? <laughs> First you come, you tell him, hey, Mr. President, Good to see you. How was your day? I brought you some bagels. <laughs> Start the conversation. Right, right away, I came for my request. You gotta bring the ice a little bit. So now, Baruch Hashem, we got the point. Purim, why Purim will remain in effect always? Now one person died. The, all the Jews were supposed to die, there was Mamash sealed. That's it. There's a date. There's a date. 127 countries, they're going to make riots, going, burning, burning Jews, stealing the property, everything. And they're free of punishment. The authority command. Go and kill all the Jews for us. We don't have time to make gas chambers. This is not Nazi Germany. Here. Talking 2400 years ago. We need your help. Everyone who kill Jews will get a medal. Plus, you can keep the home. The Goim are all excited. Wow. He's mine. No, 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 he's mine. No, 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 I call first. I call first. Itzik is mine. You take Shaul. No, no, you take David. He has a bigger uh, donkey. No, no, I want this. I want... It's not fair. He's mine. Okay, you kill him, I'll kill him. Okay, let's make a bet. This is how it was. They're going on waiting anxiously to the 13th of a doubt. Then all of a sudden, they get another letter with a new stamp. Their old order, it all dismissed, all cancelled. Not only that, now it's the other way around. The Jews are going to find all the Nazis and eliminate them. And how many they killed? 75,300. Do you know, I know you won't believe it, but I don't know if you remember, for those of you who listened to me long enough, about 10 years ago I asked, I don't understand these Persians in Iran. They hate Israel so much. They dying to make a bomb. They suffer sanctions and sicknesses and all kinds of problems just to get the bomb. What exactly they want the bomb for? Just for Israel. Let's face it. That's their top priority. So they want the bomb so much, they're willing to suffer so much to get the bomb. They hate Israel so much, and they are reserving the grave of Mordechai and Esther in the city of Hamadan, who used to be Shushan. Hamadan in Iran, there's a grave of Mordechai and Esther. It's a holy site in the government of Iran. I say to myself, I don't understand this Iranians, <laughs> you have, they believe in the Tanakh. Muslims believe in the 24 books of Judaism. All of them, the prophets, all the way from Genesis to Song of Songs. So they, one of the 24 books is Megillat Esther. So they read over there that the Jews that they hate so much killed 75,300 of their citizens in their country. And what do they do in return? They say we will praise Mordechai and Esther for killing all of us. Make sense? Make sense or not? It's similar a little bit. Imagine Israel now will make in, uh, in Israel, they will take the grave of uh, Ahmed Yassin, the founder of the Hamas, or Nasrallah, the head of the Hezbollah, and they make a site and they say, this one is a holy site. Just like the prophets and King David. He <laughs> said, no, you're out of your mind. It would be a joke. Guess what? They're not so dumb after all. Yesterday, they had hundreds of students demonstrating at the place. How can it be a holy sight for us? They made a genocide to our people. They finally got it. 
took them 2,400 years to realize. <laughs> 2,400 years it took them to understand. So they made a huge demonstration. That's not, that's enemies. These Mordechai and Esther, it's our enemies. Why we admire them? They bark and bark and bark. The answer of the government was, you know, in Parsi you say, Chafeshot. You know what it means? Yes, sir. Choke and be quiet. <laughs> That's when you want to tell someone in, in a nice Farsi, shut up. <laughs> Instead of be quiet. Meaning, it's unbelievable. These Ayatollahs, these Ayatollahs, they see in a Megillah that Mordechai and Esther actually brought on them a mini holocaust with 75,000 people. And yet, they still reserve the grave and give funds to their every year and uh, put security there. And even there are signs in Hebrew over there. In Hebrew. Well, what do you see? What do you learn from that? Let's see who's clever. What do you get from this, this whole thing? They want to appeal to the UN. They want to appeal to the UN. Don't be a politician now. <laughs> they want a lot of things. They know the truth. I'll tell you what I learned from it. When Hashem wants something, don't look for logic. <laughs> In the heart of evilness, if you want people to admire you as a Jew, they'll make everyone bow down to you. In their face they will read, those two killed us, brought the destruction on our country back then. And we have nothing. We're going to still bow down to them now after 2,400 years. Why? Because Hashem said so. Who can tell me where does it say what I just say in the Tanakh? The verse. There is a verse about it. Huh? When Moshe Kafaro, no matter what, I'll protect you. You understand this? Help me here. No? You know? I'll help you out. Birzot Hashem Tarke Ish, Gam Oivav Yashlim Imo. When Hashem is happy from an individual, he will force his enemies to make peace with him, whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. Meaning to bow down to him. What do we do when we finish Tfilat Shmon Eisrei? We put our head down and we walk three steps, or say Shalom Bivroma, we ask Shalom Aleinu, but Kol Amo Yisrael, Imo Amen. Why do we have to put our head down and walk back? Meaning I surrender. Here, my head is down, I walk back. I'm not aggressive. Here, I surrender. Now you make peace with me. As long as I'm aggressive and I have, uh, you know, that I understand why I don't want to make peace with you. Here, I bow down, I surrender, I'm nothing. I back down, you know, I, I walk back. That's when we do, we want to make peace. First step, put your ego down. Shut your mouth. Completely. Enough with your arrogance. Put your head down. When the waves come, you know, the Hawaii waves could be 30 feet more. Huge, like a building. If you want to stop the, the waves with your body, you're going like this. Hey, stop! What's going to happen? Boom! You get it in your face, we'll throw you down to the bottom and you die. What's the best way to fight? The waves, put your head down, go under. The waves go above you. The Chazonish said to Rav Galinsky, Rav Yaakov, they put a, a lamp post next to my house. Now you know, when a big giant rabbi speak, there's always depth and Endless amount of wisdom in every word that comes out of their mouth. They never speak just to speak, like we do. Oh, how are you? How's it going? No. So Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky is another giant Chacham. Right away, you know, the Chazonish want to tell me something. 
He doesn't want to tell me that the city of Nebra put a lamppost next to his home. Come on. The biggest chacham on earth. So he said, I'm listening. What is the real message here? He said to him, so when I saw that they put the lamb, I walked. When I walk away from the lamb, I become bigger and bigger. I look at my shadow. Every mistake I make, I go. When I come back towards the lamb, my image becomes smaller and smaller until I hit the lamppost, meaning I'm right under the light, I don't exist. There's no shadow. And Rav Galinsky said, very nice, so. He said, you know what I learned from it? Why Hashem made it like this? That the, close, the further away you go, it looks like a shadow is the size of a building. You get closer to the light, you become. Light is Torah. Torah is light to the world. The more you leave the Torah, you're going to business, politics, sports, uh, all kinds of university. The further away you become, the more heretic you become, the more infidel you are, the bigger a doctor you become, a shark lawyer, a tycoon businessman. So what do you think? I'm greater and greater. I'm bigger and greater. Why? Because you keep going away from the Torah. The hallucination is I get greater and greater. But it's all a shadow. It's nothing. There's no, there's no, no existence to this shadow. Everybody knows. It's not you. The closer you go to the Torah, to the light, you become smaller and smaller every step. Why? The more Torah you learn, the more you understand how you are nothing. Once you already reach the Torah, now you and the Torah is one, like the Chazon Ish was. Everything in the Torah you know. Perfectly, by heart. Super, super holy brain. You are nothing. There's not even a tiny shadow. You don't exist. So the more you are engraved into the light of the Torah, the more you understand that you are nothing. The further away you go from the truth of the Torah, the more you think you are somebody. That's what happened to all the educated Jews here in America. The more educated they are with secular studies, the more wicked they became. With some exception to the rule. There's always exception to the rule. Always. No matter what you're going to find in the world, Hashem made the world. There is a rule, and there's always an exception to the world. Lechol klal, yesh yotze min haklal. We say it every morning in a prayer. Chol hayotze min haklal, lo lelamed al atzmo yatsa, ila lelamed al haklal yatsa. Say it every morning in a shachrit. There is rule, general rule, and there is an exception to the rule. The exception to the rule did not come to teach about itself. It came to teach about the rule. Let me clarify. When I lived the, for one year in Lower East Side, Manhattan, there was a city back there in East Broadway, no, in Grand Street, corner of Clinton. Mm -hmm. Probably it's still there, the bank. One night, it was almost uh, maybe 12 or 1 a.m., it was snowing. One uh, temperature like now, zero degrees. And I came to make an ATM the deposit, you know, you have an envelope mm -hmm. with the ATM. So the bank has two doors, two glass doors, one and then another one, and then you have the ATM machine. Like only the ATM machine, three ATM machines there. I see a homeless on a wheelchair with no legs, sitting on a wheelchair. I don't know if he was homeless, I don't know if he was uh, somebody who came to... Maybe he wanted just to get warm inside the bank because uh, over there they eat, it's not cold like outside. Maybe he wanted to make a deposit, I don't know. The man on a wheelchair was waiting by the door because he, sitting on a wheelchair with no legs, did not have the strength to actually push the door at the same time to hold the wheelchair inside and to open another door and, and, and roll himself inside. So he waited, who knows how long he waited, who knows? I don't know, I just got there, I opened it for him. I opened, he rolled in, I opened the other door, he rolled in. I was thinking to myself when I came out, 
I never ever appreciate the fact that I have legs. I take it for granted. I appreciate making money, I appreciate do, getting this, getting that, getting safe from accidents, yes, because it's unique. But we take for granted our eyes, our hands, our legs, you know, everything, we, we, we got used to it. When do you appreciate your legs? When you see this guy cannot even open a glass door. He's going to freeze to death until the morning. Why? He cannot open a door. Then you say to yourself, wow, imagine if I was like this. Then you appreciate your legs and you thank Hashem from, from your heart. Thank you, Hashem, I have legs. Even you think about it. Thank you that I have legs. Thank you, I'm not like this. He is an exception to the rule who came to testify about the rule. Most people have legs. So when you are lucky to be in a rule, whenever you see an exception to the rule, feel lucky about what you have. Don't take it for granted. That's what it is. On Shabbat, wow, time ran out. I'll just say one last thing and one, well, the rest will continue in Brooklyn tomorrow. On Shabbat, the parasha became V'atat Etzaveh. Tell Bnei Israel, they have to take shemen zayit, olive oil, katit, like what we call cold press. Olive oil, there's a lot of special things we're told about olive oil. One, the nation of Israel is similar to olive oil and similar to grape tree. To, al to olive tree and to, to olive, and to grape tree. What's the similarity between us and the olives and to us and the grape tree? So olive, how do you make olive oil? You take the olives, they're very bitter in the beginning, and hard. Bitter, hard, basically almost worthless. You begin to beat them, boom, 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 boom. Well, with a lot of patience. So they have machines, but back in time, that's why olive oil is always the most expensive oil. It's the hardest to get. Until few drops of oil come from each olive. There's a lot of garbage. You have the seed, and you have all the, the things. After they all came, it looks like a powder. Nothing you can do with that. Few drops came out. You need thousands of thousands of olives to make one little bottle of olive oil. Not so simple. So, how do you get the olives to begin with? You come to the tree, you shake the tree. You don't pick them up one by one. <laughs> if we had to pick up the olives one by one, olive oil will be $300 a bottle. Forget about it. So, you shake it. Shake the tree. Shake it. Connect it to a camel, make the camel run. Donkey, they found primitive ways. Shake the branches, they begin to fall. Easily they fall. They collect all of them, bring them there, press on them, little by little, another drop, another drop, another drop. Very interesting. The Jewish nation, the Torah says, stiff neck nation, stubborn, like to fight back, to resist. Whatever you tell them, they have this desire to do the opposite. Come, young Torah. No, not now, Abba. No, yes, tomorrow. Always it's a... Shem said, I'm Kshe'ofadem. Stiff neck. Stop him. So what happened? How do you get something out of a stubborn person? You gotta be extra aggressive with him. There's no other way. Some people understand the hard way. Only the hard way. You're going to open your restaurant. You're going to get $15,000 fine from Como. <laughs> you open it second time, $50,000. Third time, $150,000. One restaurant in Queens Boulevard got over $100,000 fine for opening. Yes. You learn the hard way. Mask, $1,000. All of a sudden, all the Orthodox people, Purim began. <laughs> Mother Purim, it was already after my son. Thousand dollar fine in Williamsburg, in Park. They walk around looking. 
<sighs> you take away the thousand dollar fine, probably five percent will put. Right? That's the way we are. Stiff nation. You boom, boom, boom. Finally, the oil comes up. The good comes out of the bed. Only with hard, hard makot, one, boom, boom. Same thing. A man wants to get, a woman wants to get a get from her husband. Many of them torture her for weeks, for months, for years. For years. The Rambam said, Makim Oto, you hear him with a whip, Ad Sheyomar Otseani, until you say, I want to give the get. They ask, but you're not allowed to force the get. The man has to give the get by willingly. You force him by, by the gun, give the get or kill you. It's not a kosher get, it's called get me Meuse, meaning you force him to do it. That's not a get. This woman may marry, if she's going to go and get married again, the kids will be mamzerim. It has to be willingly. So how can you say you beat him up until he says, oh, come, come, I'll give you the get. Come, let me sign. Why? Because the nature of a Jew, he always wants to do what Hashem wants him to do. That's his real him. But because Hashem made us such a huge evil inclination, much more than the goyim, that's the Gemara say, Israel as Sheba Umot. Either you're the best in the world or you're the worst. Either you are Chacham Mazuz or Chacham Rav Chaim Kanievsky or you are Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Put this next to this. Lavdil Ben Ataor Latame. Either you are Avigdor Miller, Rav Avigdor Miller, or you are Rav Avigdor Liber, or Avigdor Liberman. If you know who it is, this Rasha Merushan. You have Rabbi Victor Miller and you have Rabbi Victor Lieber. The holiest, most righteous tzaddik to the filthiest one on earth. They both consider to be Jews, Miller and Lieberman. If you wouldn't know who we're talking here about, two Jews, Miller and Lieberman, no? One is holy, perfect human being, tzaddik, talmid, chacham, yere shamayim, genius. One a Jew that is actually 100% a Nazi. Hey Torah, hey rabbis, hey religion. Today he was making a party that now every reform can make everybody he wants Jew. Why? To bring another two, three million going from Russia and destroy Israel completely. I'm so happy today. That's what the Gemara says, right? So now you beat up the person, you get rid of his Yetzer you let him relax? No? Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry, Rabbi. I don't know why I gave you such a hard time. Come, come, let me give her a gift. She deserves it. Get rid of the Yetzirah. Once you get rid of the Yetzirah, <laughs> you always want to do the right thing. Hashem bara et adam yashar, Chazal say. The original form of a human being is straight. Why it's left and right crooked all the time? The resistant, the Yetzirah. You want to run straight, but someone is blocking you like in football. So what happens? You go right, you go left, you try. Because you have resistant. So, conclusion. Why olive? When you eat olives, it makes you forget. You become Sleepy Joe. I saw a video yesterday. I would like to thank uh, my staff, uh, Mr. This, Mr. That. Uh, 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 what am I doing here? Uh, I don't want to forget people. Forgot uh, what he wants to say. That, that's the leader of the world. Declare Saudi as an enemy. Declare Iran as a friend. Declare Israel as an enemy. Soon he's going to declare North Korea as a friend. Everything by his hand is the opposite. Maybe uh, too much olives, I don't know. <laughs> You eat too much olives, you become forgetfulness. You're forgetting things. But if you eat olive oil, it's improve your memory. You go and tell me the logic here. When I eat olive, there is olive oil in it. You eat it, you feel the moisture. So how can it be that now when I eat olives, it makes my memory was here, now it's a little bit less. 
But when I eat olive oil, my memory becomes a little bit better. How is it possible? Olives is the good and the bad mix. When the good mix with the bad, it's all bad. You take a bucket, it has some dirt inside, black dirt, all kinds of mud. You put water, water is pure. But there is a little mud, 5% mud in a bucket. The whole water looks black and brown. Nobody wants to drink from it. It contaminates the whole thing, even though it's 95% pure. 5% garbage, nobody will drink from it. Even one drop of poison, nobody wants to drink. Once you separate the good and the bad, you take the olive oil out by smacking and smacking and you get rid of all the bad, now you, be, now you have something pure. That will improve your memory. With the bed together, will damage your memory. Now, what about grapes? Why we are compared to grapes? Grapes, how do you make grapes? Same thing, you put them on the floor and you have rubber boots and you step on them. And the uh, drops of, uh, of grape juice eventually will become wine. Grapes is very interesting. First you step on the grapes, then the grapes step on you. <laughs> if you're so impurely. Right? How do you make grapes? You step on the grapes. So the grapes is under your feet. You control it. After you drink the grapes, the grapes put you to sleep. The grapes control you. This is the Jewish nation. In this world they're going to torture us. Holy cause, pogrom, this, that. Inquisition, non-stop anti-Semitism. They control us. Persians, Greeks, Romans, Babylonians, Arabs, United Nations, non-stop problems. Next world, like the, like the wine, will be on top of everyone. Grapes cannot climb to height on its own. It needs to climb on something. It doesn't have a thick branch. Similar, if you take pieces of wood, if you go to the vineyard, you see they have two pieces of wood, dead wood. They stick them with distance, and the grapes climb on it. It becomes like a net. The Jewish nation, the grape is the living Jews. Why? They connected with the roots of the ground. They have no existence without climbing on the dead Jews. Rambam, Shulchan Aruch, Gemara, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Moshe Rabbeinu, the Nevi'im. Without them we have nothing. We will have Gemara, we will have Alakha, we will have Torah. Everything we know comes from our tradition. We are not allowed to move an inch from the tradition. We can speak to our fathers. Therefore, a kosher Jew is the one that lean on a dead Jew. Why are you like this? Because the Rambam was like this. 850 years ago. The Rambam is not in the world anymore, but I am sitting on his shoulder. Why? Without him, where would I know how to go? It's very interesting. If the grape that you put in the ground, the seeds, begins to grow, and you put the stick one feet, one foot to the right, the grape has eyes. Will always know where to go, to the shortest distance. If you put few sticks, it will always know to go to the closest stick or fence, or anything nearby. What happens when the grapes reach the stick, you take out the stick, and move it to the opposite direction? 180 degrees opposite, don't make a U-turn. Well, always search for the, for the stick. Why? We are the Jewish nation. Without climbing on the shoulders of our fathers and rabbis, we have nothing. Remember. That's what happened to the reforms and conservatives. They left our tradition. They left Shulchan Aruch. They left the Gemara. They left the Rabbi. Look what came out of them. Married men with men, enemies of Israel, organizing abomination, gay parade, marrying non-Jews, marrying animals, getting married to dogs, making bar mitzvah to dogs. They lost their mind completely. Poor Iran. Uh, unbelievable what's happening with them. Every day something new with them. Why? When you do not follow the footsteps of your holy fathers, you have no tradition. I will finish with a story. Napoleon came to Israel to 
hundred years ago, and he passed by a synagogue. He was the leader of you know the army of the world, Napoleon Bonaparte. He saw hundreds of Jews crying on the floor. It was Tisha B'Av, night of Av. The Jews cry. Two hundred years ago, they really cried, not like today. Checking when will I get to the office? I see them on the floor, all crying. Napoleon you know, said, "What happened? Who's these people?" He said, "The Jews." Why they climb? Say they mourn the destruction of the temple. He said, wow, when did it happen? 1800 years ago. Huh? <laughs> now they remember to, to cry. He said, no, sir. They cry like this every year. Napoleon say, a nation that connects to its past has a future. That made him a Jew lover. There's another story that Jew saved his life. He didn't know that when he was running away. But actually he admired the Jews and he even told the Jews, if you want to renew the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was not renewed from the destruction of the temple. It's over 1,700 years. If you want to renew the Sanhedrin, I'm giving you permission to do it. Freedom. Freedom of religion. Do it. Sanhedrin, you know what Sanhedrin means? They make rules that applies to all over the world. The Goim, even to the Goim. It's the top, it's like the real Supreme Court of the world. 71 biggest rabbis in the world. They have to sit in Sanhedrin. Even the Goim is my head. But guess what happened? Why we did not renew the Sanhedrin? Politics. There was an argument between the rabbis of Tzfat to the rabbis of Yerushalayim. Arguments, arguments, arguments. Obviously, Hashem did not want Sanhedrin until Mashiach would come. Soon, Bezrat Hashem. We'll see you tomorrow in Brooklyn, 8 o'clock. Baruch Adonai Leolat. Amen, Amen. Adi Hanan Yavina Kashi Amir. Hatzak, Hanush Pachul, Ezakot, Et Yisrael, Nefichach.